Tonight's scripture is from Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 36. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James and John and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of, pe of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil, on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. This is God's Word. We've been looking at the uh, life of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. We're going to just be looking week after week at the life of Jesus through the eyes of one Gospel writer, Luke. And um, the subject of this particular passage doesn't immediately jump out at the reader, I don't believe. But the subject of this passage is community. And the first part, in the first part, Jesus tells us about the promise of a true human community. In the middle part of the passage, he tells us about the parts or the components of this true community. And at the very, very end, he shows us where we get the power for it. So you have the promise of it, you have the parts of it, and you have the power for it. Now, this first section, which talks about the promise, I'm talking about verses uh, 12 to about 20. Uh, unless you read this in the context of the rest of the Bible, in fact, that's usually the case, uh, but unless you read this in the context of the rest of the Bible, especially the book of Exodus, which we spent time studying in the fall, you may not get the significance of what Jesus does. On the, the mountain, after intense prayer, he chooses 12 disciples, 12 apostles. Why? Now, why? He didn't have that many apostles, uh, disciples, and out of the disciples, he chooses 12 leaders. You know, if you have 30, if you have a church of 30, why elect 20, 12 officers? You know, it doesn't make much sense. But the 12 was significant. And then he comes down off the mountain, and he gives them the word of God. 
Now, the question is, uh, what does that mean? And the answer is, go back, when, when was the last time that happened? At Mount Sinai, God called together the 12 tribes and sent Moses down off the mountain with his word. What was the purpose of the law of God coming off of Mount Sinai? What was the purpose of it? Popular uh, understanding of the Word of God is, or of the law of God, most people, I think, think that the reason we have the law of God is it's a way for us to find out how to find God and be saved. You obey the law of God to be forgiven or be saved or get to heaven or get eternal life and so on. But when you read the book of Exodus, narratively, that's impossible because God gives them the, does not give them the law, then save them from slavery. He saves them from slavery, then gives them the law. And therefore, the law of God is never, in either the Old Testament or the New Testament, the way you get forgiven or the way you're saved. So why did God, if he'd already saved them from slavery, why did he give them the law? And the answer is because what he says in the book of Exodus is, I'm going to make you into a people. I'm going to make you into a true human community, a new human community. God says, as it were, in the book of Exodus, he says, the reason why human community has unraveled everywhere, the reason why individuals are war with individuals and families that were with families and nations that were with nations, the reason all that's happening is because when your relationship with me unraveled, all other relationships unravel. And when a relationship with me is restored, that restores all other human relationships. And therefore, I am creating a community in which we show the world that if you restore a relationship with me, all of the unraveling is woven again together into a fabric. I'm going to show that when you relate to me that you're brought into a new human community. And what it means, therefore, when Jesus comes down with his 12 and he begins to give the Sermon on the Mount, this is what's called the Sermon on the Mount. It's a shorter version here in Luke 6. The longer one is in Matthew 5 to 7. He has not simply given us a manual of ethical, individual ethical prescriptions, even though, I mean, as an individual, you do learn a great deal about how to live from the Sermon on the Mount. What he's actually here to say is, I'm here to do the next stage in the creation of a true community. This stage, notice in verse 17, includes Jews and Gentiles. It's across the races. You not only have people from Judea and Jerusalem, but also Tyre and Sidon. And so Jesus says this is the next stage in God's reconstitution of the human race. I am present with power to create a new counterculture, a new society, a new human community. All, you know, think of threads. You know, a thread is so fragile. It's gone. Our human lives are as fragile as threads, but if you take thousands of threads and you really interweave them, so that, the, so that they are deeply interdependent. They become a piece of fabric that is enormously strong and very often beautiful. And God says, when you relate to me, Jesus says, when you enter into a relationship with me, I will weave you in to a human community deeper and more beautiful than you can imagine. And that is really the first point. <laughs> the first point is that to be saved by Jesus means not just to have your individual sins forgiven, it does mean that, but it means more. It means to be woven in to a new human a community, a true human community that God is creating. Now, before I move on, can I, just, can I just help you meditate on the importance of this for yourself? Do you know how important true community is? When you find a piece of music that you just love, what do you do with it? You can't enjoy it until you get somebody else and you play it for them, and as they listen to it, their eyes light up, and then you can enjoy it. Why? We are so geared for community that we can't even have an aesthetic experience outside of community, at least not a full one. Or think about your self-image. You know, a lot of people in, your, in this culture say this. Your self-esteem and your self-image should not have much to do with what other people think of you. That shouldn't matter. Don't base your self-image on what other people think of you. You decide what is right or wrong for you, and you live up to that. So it shouldn't matter what anybody else thinks. You create your own self-image. You create your own self-esteem. Go ahead, try it. Just try it. Everybody else in the world thinks I'm stupid, but I think I'm smart, and therefore I feel smart. You won't be able to do it. It's, it's, you can't get a sense of self outside of community. You can't get a sense of, you can't get an aesthetic experience outside of community. You, 
and listen, there's nothing more sad than to read biographies. Uh, most biographies, of course, are written by, about people who have achieved heights of power and influence, usually. And so often, the only way to get into places of huge power and influence is at the expense over the year of relationships. And there's nothing sadder than to read the biographies, and in their old age, so many of these folks pathetically come to realize that in the end, what really counts, what in the end, what really makes their lives meaningful is not the plaques on the wall and not the awards and not the money and not the acclaim. It's relationships, and most of them have unraveled, and they, it's so pathetic to see them reaching out at the end of their lives to people that they've alienated because in the end, all that counts is relationships. You need community. You want it. It's, the, it's one of the deepest needs of your heart, and yet we live in a world that, is, that doesn't seem to be able to produce it. If you're a leader in any way at all, if you're the head of a department or an institution, or if you're in any kind of capacity in which you're considered a leader, most of what is called leadership is really 90% of what you're doing is trying to keep all the human relationships from blowing apart, all the relationships of the individuals who are underneath you, if you're ever in leadership, you realize that people are always getting slighted, always getting upset, always getting offended, always falling out with each other all the time. There's something in the water. There's something in the air. There's a force field in the world that seems to make community impossible, and yet it's the deepest need of your heart. What hope is there for us? And Jesus shows up and says, power is coming from me to create a true community. I'm your only hope. I'm your only hope. So the first thing he shows up with is a promise of true community. Now, I don't know where else you're going to look. Now, the second thing he tells us in the body of the, of the passage, uh, from about verse 20 all the way near to the end, he tells us something about the parts or the components of this true community. Now, what I'm going to do, if, if, if you're, there, there are issues in this material, uh, it, it would certainly uh, benefit from a line-by-line -line you know, three, four, five, six series of teachings going through it, but I'm not going to do that. I mean, by the way, if you, if you go to the tape ministry, uh, if you go to the website, you'll find that there's, over the years, other sermons on some of these issues which go deeper into this and that, but I would just like to give you the broad sweep. Jesus says there are two things that will be characteristic of this new community that I'm creating. The values of the people inside and your relationships to the people outside. The values held in common with, by people inside and the relationship and the regard you have for people outside. So first of all, let's take a look at the values for the people inside. This, the set of blessings and woes from verses 20 down to 26, you know what that is? Two sets of values. Now, Jesus shows up and says, I bring the kingdom. Notice the word in verse 20. I bring the kingdom. I have brought a new kingdom. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means more than this, but at least this. A kingdom is an administration. And uh, if you're in a department and a new head comes in to your department over you, you'll find that suddenly everything's getting done differently. Why? Because the new head usually has a different set of values and therefore is, in a sense, bringing in a new administration. Uh, in fact, that's what an administration is. It's operating things on the basis of a value, set of values. That your old head, the old head of your department, valued these things and didn't value these things, and the new head of the department values a lot of things that the old head didn't value and thought was unimportant, and, and the new head uh, thinks are unimportant things that the old head thought were valuable, and that's what the difference is in administration. And Jesus says, let me tell you what the values are of my kingdom and of my administration. Look at the second set from verses uh, 23 on down. There are four values that he mentions, rich, full, laughing, all men speak well of you. And here's what those four values are. The first one is power, because actually wealth and poverty are matters of power. Number one, power. Number two, comfort. These are people who are full. That means that their sensual needs are satiated. That means they have food, they have clothing, they have beautiful homes, you know. So power, comfort. And then what's this laugh thing? It certainly looks like Jesus is talking about people who are having fun. That's not true. Because the word laugh here would be better translated, gloat. Why would you gloat? 
Jesus is not talking about people having fun. He's talking about people having won, people who have competed and have succeeded. In other words, here's what gloating is. I won. You didn't. That's gloating. And Jesus is talking about that as the third value, power, comfort, success, and recognition. All speak well of you. Celebrity, acclaim, and so on. So that's, the first, that's one set of values, see? Power, comfort, rec- success, and recognition. Now, there's a second set of values, and they're up here in verses 20 through 22. And as you notice, they're exactly the opposite. They're completely parallel ex- and exactly the opposite. Weakness, sacrifice, grief, and weeping, and exclusion. Okay? Weakness, sacrifice, grief, and exclusion. And you know what Jesus is saying? He says, if you enter into my administration, if you leave the kingdom of this world and you enter into my kingdom, the things the world values are unimportant to me and the things that the world despises are important to me. Here are the things that I don't value at all in my kingdom. Power, comfort, uh, success, and recognition. And here are the things that I value in my kingdom. Weakness, sacrifice, grief, and exclusion. Who wants to join his kingdom? You know, you look at that and you say, are you crazy? Well, should we change our, church, our, our name to the first church of Christian masochists? And w- one thing that really helped me better than any, anything I ever read on this chapter was a little line by a, a, a commentator on the book of Luke named Michael Wilcock. And in it, he was commenting on this chapter, and he put it in a nutshell. He says, in the life of God's people, it will be seen, first of all, a remarkable reversal of values. The people of God will prize what the world calls pitiable and suspect what the world thinks desirable. Prize what the world calls pitiable and suspect what the world thinks desirable. And that opened it up for me because here's what he's trying to say. Jesus is not saying to seek these things but to prize them. And he's not saying to refuse these things but to suspect them. He's not saying that you go, you seek weakness and suffering and weeping, but you prize what you have. And he's not saying that you refuse power and success, but you suspect it. Now, if you want to understand this, let me put it in a nutshell. Jesus says, when you enter into a relationship with me, I create in your inner being a radical freedom so that power, comfort, success, and recognition have no control over you. And once you get that radical freedom psychologically, it also changes all of your social relationships. In other words, Jesus says, when you enter into a relationship with me, I give you a radical freedom so that you're free from the control by power and comfort and recognition and status. And once you get that radical inner freedom, that creates a new community with all other people that have that same freedom. Let me break that down for you. (laughs) That was a mouthful. First, Jesus is saying, to be in my kingdom means these things don't control you anymore. I give you a radical freedom. Imagine two people, and both of them have great jobs, lucrative jobs, make a lot of money, status jobs, lots of perks. And let's say both of them suddenly come to realize, and this doesn't take much imagination nowadays, that they're about to lose those jobs and never find a commensurate one. Jesus says, imagine a person in the world's kingdom, how do they react? How do they react? Here's how they react. They're devastated. And the reason they're devastated is because they have no other significance other than this fact I've made this, got this job. And they have no other security for their family than I make this amount of money. This is the main source of their significance. It's the main source of the security. They're losing their job and they're devastated. Okay, now let's take a look at somebody in Jesus' kingdom. They're losing their job. What does this mean? First of all, it means they weep. You notice Jesus does not say, well, if you're in my kingdom, you have this faith, and then you're imperfect. You know, when bad things happen, you say, I'm just praising the Lord. No, 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 no. Jesus says, there's weeping in my kingdom. There's weeping. Things go wrong. There's weeping and weakness and grief. But if you look carefully, he says, blessed are you who weep now. Notice he doesn't say this. You're weeping now, but you will be blessed because later on you'll be rewarded in heaven or something like that. 
You're weeping now, but later you'll be blessed. You're hungry now, but later you'll be filled. No, what he says is, you're weeping now, and you're blessed as you weep. You're blessed now. You are blessed. Present tense. This is a paradox, and here's what Jesus is saying. The word blessed is a very powerful word. Both in Greek and Hebrew, it means deep satisfaction. And in the kingdoms of this world, laughing and blessedness go together, but never weeping and blessedness. But in Jesus' kingdom, here's what Jesus says. I give you a blessedness that is impervious to circumstances. And not only that, but in, in many ways, it's actually incredibly increased by weeping. Because just as the stars get brighter, the darker the night gets, so the blessing I put into the center of every human being who comes to faith in me and who knows my grace, there's a blessing in you that gets stronger when you weep, that gets stronger when you hunger, that gets stronger when you're weak, that gets stronger when you sacrifice. There is a certain welcome and honor that comes from God that actually never you really tap into, you never really taste its sweetness, you never really get energized by it until you lose the world's recognition. There's a filledness, there's a blessedness that doesn't really come to you until you go through these kinds of weaknesses. And therefore, you see, when Michael Wilcox says, in Jesus' kingdom we prize those things that everyone in the world would absolutely avoid at all costs. It doesn't mean we want them, we seek them, but when they come, when they come, we don't care. When they come, we prize the fact that they make us wiser instead of more despondent. They make us kinder instead of more bitter. They make us more blessed. In other words, if you're in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, there is a radical freedom so that you're not at all controlled by power and comfort and recognition and status. To the degree that you are submitted to the Lordship of Christ, to the degree that you actually have thought out and with the word of Christ and the spirit of Christ really brought yourself into the kingdom, to that degree, you are radically free from those things. And if you are radically free from those things psychologically, you know what that means sociologically? The people who their job is their significance and security, how do they react to people who have just never made it? They've never made it. They're just pushing a broom. They've never made it. That's just the reason why Jesus says, in my kingdom, the poor, see, in my kingdom, the people that the world considers losers, the people that the world consider that the world disdains, in my kingdom, you're not looking down at anybody, you're looking over at people. Why? Because if you have a psychological freedom from power, you're psychologically free from control of power and comfort and recognition and status and so on, so that you'd be socially free. They don't matter to you like they used to. Your friendships, your relationships, the way you look at people, people you used to disdain, people you used to look down at, you don't anymore. If you're in my kingdom, Jesus says. There's a complete reversal of values in my kingdom. But that's not all. As amazing as that is, as amazing as that is, you see why everyone who shares that radical freedom would come into a community and people who never used to be able to get along outside of Christ, inside Christ, they can get along. People would never mesh. People would never be able to interweave. You can. See how radically different that is? But Jesus' community that he creates is not only characterized by this reversal of values inside, it's also characterized by a unique relationship with people outside. Now, what do I mean by that? Here's what I mean. Over the years, over the centuries, there have been actually some groups, there have been many groups that have said, we don't care about the world, we don't care about their recognition or success, their society, we're going to withdraw. We're going to come out and we're going to form our own little society, an egalitarian society where we really take care of each other, we really interweave with each other and so on. And there have been many people like that. But the question is, how do they treat people who don't share their beliefs? And Jesus says, this is the, where my community is different than other tight-knit communities. Why? Well, it, it, this brings up this whole issue of tolerance, doesn't it? And it, is that a hot issue in a place like New York? In fact, it's one of the big, the first questions that when you start talking with people in New York about Christianity, about the gospel, one of the very first things that comes up is the whole issue of tolerance. 
And it goes something like this. I, I, I clipped this out of the newspaper a couple months ago, and I won't even tell you where I got it because, you know, basically, if you look far enough, if you look carefully enough every single day in the New York Times, you're going to see this somewhere. Um, quote, people who think they have the truth are dangerous. Everyone has the right to determine what is true for him or herself. No one should try to press their view of truth on others. People who think they have the truth, they're dangerous. You should never tell people, I have the truth and you don't. You should follow my truth. Everyone has the right to determine what's true for him or herself. No one should try to press their view of truth on others. Well, there's a problem with that statement. When you say, hey, who knows what the truth is? There probably isn't truth. Everybody has to decide what's true for him or herself. The view that there's no objective truth and what really matters is individual rights is a particular view of the nature of things. It's a Western, Northern European, 18th century, Enlightenment thing. It's a particular view of human rights and a particular view of truth, and it's fine. If you believe that, it's fine, but do you realize not everybody shares that view? And when you say to somebody, listen, there is no such thing as truth, that's a position, that's fine. And you're saying, and you shouldn't be trying to tell other people how to believe. What you're saying is you need to Drop your non-enlightenment view and take mine. So you're doing exactly the thing to the person that you're telling them they're not allowed to do to you. Exactly. See, what everybody says, look, tolerance means not to believe that there is such a thing as truth and let people make up their minds for themselves. That is a view of things. That is a truth that you are saying, you need to adopt my view because if you don't, you're lacking in something. You're unenlightened. So tolerance can't be to say, we don't know who has the truth. It can't be, because everybody has a view of truth, whether they admit it or not, and everybody thinks that their view is better than others, and they wish that people would adopt theirs. Everybody does. You're doing it whether you admit it or not. So tolerance can't be a lack of convictions about truth. Everybody has them. Tolerance can't be not trying to convert people, because everybody does. To say you mustn't convert people is to ask people to take up your epistemology, your approach to truth, and leave theirs behind. It's the very thing you're telling them not to do, and you're doing it to them. So then what's tolerance? Tolerance, then, is not a lack of convictions about truth. Tolerance is how you treat the people who differ with you. Tolerance isn't a lack of beliefs. Tolerance is... Do your beliefs, how do your beliefs lead you to treat people who don't share your beliefs? And here's where Jesus is as radical as you will ever find. When people say the trouble with religion, uh, trouble with Christianity, it's intolerant because you think you have the truth and other people don't. To say that is a f understanding of the nature of things which you are pressing at that very moment and saying you should adopt mine. It's, it, it's, imp it's unavoidable. It's unavoidable. And let me show you why Christianity of course, any religion, anything can be intolerant if you, if you abuse it. But let me show you what Jesus Christ says the, the relationship of his Christians, his believers, his followers should be toward people outside. It's in the very last part. He says, let's not talk about just people who differ with you. Let's talk about enemies. Let's not talk about people who just have different beliefs. Let's talk about people who are out to get you. And he says, I want two things in your relationship to them. First, Verse 28, pray for those who mistreat you. That's an inner thing. He says, when you see someone not only who disagrees with you, but someone who's actually out to hurt you, I want you to engage in an inner discipline by which you drain yourself of any ill will toward that person. When he says pray, what he's actually saying is, I want you to see that person as someone who's just as much in need as you, another human being with all needs, and I want you to bring yourself into the position where you want their flourishing, no matter what they've done for you, to you, rather than their pain. I mean, Miroslav Volf has a famous place where he says, forgiveness flounders because I exclude the enemy from the community of humans and exclude myself from the community of sinners. So the first thing Jesus says is, anybody not only who differs with you, but even who's someone who's tried to hurt you, I forbid you to think of yourself as superior to them. I want you to see them as another human being with needs. And I want you to drain yourself of 
ill will toward them. I want you to will their flourishing, will their good. So I, first of all, he says, I want you to do an inner work. And the second thing I want you to do is an outer work. What's the outer work? Do good. He doesn't just say pray. He doesn't just say refrain from revenge. He says you must do good in your actions. You must do good. Now, what does that mean? Well, let me ask you a question. Is the best thing for a person, is the, is the most good thing for a person who's lied or who's cheated or who's oppressed you or has done something wrong like that and who seems like that's a pattern in his or her life, is the best thing for them just to sort of let them continue doing it? Do you think they'll have a good life if you just let them keep on going? Do you think they will? No. So what does it mean to do good to somebody who's really, 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 really in the wrong? The answer is, once you've drained yourself of any ill will, to confront them, to either try to persuade them at best, or convince them, or at the very least, restrain them. That would be the best thing to do. Oh, wait a minute, somebody says, that's not what it looked like to me. It looks like he's saying you should let people walk all over you. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think it's good for somebody? You're supposed to do good. You think it's good for somebody to let them just sin against you? Well, doesn't it say turn the other cheek? Ah, okay, what do you think that means? And I think the average person thinks, turn the other cheek means I just hit you on one cheek, and you turn the other cheek saying, go ahead, hit me again. I'm still breathing. That's not what it's saying. You've got to remember that in a culture where you didn't do handshaking, but you kissed. When you saw someone coming and you wanted to show them that you want to be friends, what do you do? You turn the cheek. And what Jesus Christ is saying is, here's how I want you to regard your enemies. You do not let them sin against you. You do not let them. That's not the best thing for them. You don't let them walk all over you. You don't let them walk over other, other people either. You try to confront them. You try to convince them. You try to talk with them. You maybe try to argue with them. But you must do it without an iota of desire to hurt them, to belittle them, to humiliate them at all. See, what most of us do when we're wronged, there's two possibilities. One of the things you do when someone wrongs you is you say, I'm going to get you, sucker. And you go after them and you scratch their eyes out. <laughs> Not usually, but that sometimes. Here's what well, most of the time we do. When someone wrongs us, what do we do? We say, forget it, just forget it, just, just be quiet. Don't say anything, don't bring it up, just forget it. And both of those approaches are selfish. Both of those approaches are all about you. They're all about doing good to you. They're all about your comfort, what, what you're the most comfortable doing. Always, the best thing for someone who's wronged you would be for them to have their eyes opened, right? But if you do it, the outer work, which is trying to confront them, without first having done the inner work, which is completely drained yourself of any superiority, and completely drained yourself of any desire to see them hurt and only just want to see them flourish. If you don't do the inner work, then the outer work will fail. Because when you go and you say, well, I'm going to tell them the truth because I just need to stand up for them and the best thing would be to tell them off. And if, if you haven't done this inner work, and most of the time you, you haven't, they know. They know why. You, you say, I'm just standing up to the truth, but you're trying to hurt them. You're trying to show them they're wrong. Jesus Christ says, I will give you the resources I will give you the power so that you look even at enemies, not as inferiors. You look at even at enemies as people that you want to will their flourishing. Now, can you imagine a human community that's tightly knit through belief in the Lordship of Jesus Christ and whose attitude toward people who don't share those beliefs is like that? He says, when you find a church like that, when you find a community of Christians like that, you have found the kind of community that Jesus Christ has died to create. He's died to create it. He's come to create it. He offers it to us. He says, put yourself under my kingdom. Put yourself under my lordship. And to the degree you do that, I can create that amongst you. Now, last question. Where do you get the power to have this attitude toward your enemies? Where do you get the power to have this kind of, this, this kind of uh, love of one another inside and, and such an inner blessing that you're really that free, really that free from power and recognition and comfort and, 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 and status and so on? Where do you get the power for that? And the answer is it's in the last two verses. At the very, very end of the passage, at the very end, here's what we read. Love your enemies, do good, lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. It's all there. 
Jesus Christ shows us in these last two little verses what has to happen in your life for you to get the power to be in a community like this. The first thing is you have to have a revolution in your understanding of sin and evil. I don't know if I'm going to be able to convey this, but there is a there is absolutely fascinating rhetorical game that Jesus is playing. And it may sound disrespectful to say that, but he is. Because in this last paragraph, he starts using the word sinners in a way he never uses it anywhere else in the Bible. Look, look how he's using the word sinners. He says, you know sinners. You don't want to be like sinners. Sinners love people only to get something back. Sinners lend to people, but only because they're going to make a profit. You know how sinners are. You don't want to be like sinners. You know what those sinners are like. Don't be like sinners. Now, there's no other place where Jesus talks like this. How is he using the word sinners? He's using the word sinners the way everybody else does. Sinners are those bad people over there who do not do the things we ought to do, and this is the reason what's wrong with the world. To religious people, it's those atheists. To atheists, it's those bigots. To Republicans, it's those Democrats. To Democrats, it's those Republicans. Sinners, you know what those people are like. They're the reason the world's the way it is. And Jesus goes along, and he's using the term. And he says, oh, you don't want to be like sinners. You don't want to be like sinners. How do you want to be? You want to be like, look, verse 35, you want to be like the Most High because he has given his saving mercy to who? The grateful and the moral? No. Who's he given it to? Well, he's given it to us. I mean, we're his disciples. He's given it to us, right? He's given it to us. And who are we? Hint, hint. Look what he's calling us. <laughs> He says he gives it to the ungrateful and the evil. And what Jesus is doing is by ratcheting it up, this word, this word is a stronger word than the word sinners, isn't it? In other words, here's what he's saying. He says, you don't want to be like those people out there. They're sinners. Not you. You're not sinners. You're evil. <laughs> evil? What? How could everybody be evil? How could everybody be a sinner? And when Jesus talks like that, when Jesus shows that, that not only the outsiders are sinners, but the insiders are sinners. Not only the people who've never received God's mercy, but the people who have received God's mercy. And the people who have received God's salvation, they're ungrateful and they're evil. And you say, how in the world? How can you do that? And the answer is, if you don't redefine your understanding of sin, you'll never experience the power of Jesus Christ. Our understanding of sin is breaking the rules. I keep the rules. Hmm? I don't cheat on my spouse, and I don't cheat on the income tax, and I don't kill people, and I don't steal from people. I'm obeying the Ten Commandments. I'm not sinning. If you're breaking the Ten Commandments, you are sinning. Jesus is trying to show you that you better go deeper. Here's what sin really is. It's self-salvation. It's being your own Savior. It's Savior replacement. It's trying to be your own Savior instead of letting Him be Savior. And when you realize that, suddenly you begin to realize everybody's doing it. <laughs> because here you have the religious people and the moral people, and they're trying to obey the Ten Commandments and go to church and, and read their Bible. Why? So God will have to bless them. So God will have to listen to their prayers. They're trying to be their own Savior. And the self-righteousness means that they will be conduits for evil in the world. And then you go over to the, to the irreligious person. You go to the person who throws the Bible on the ground and says, I'm going to live any way I want. There's a person who is also trying to be their own savior, but it's just a different way. And they'll be conduits for evil too. And if you look through the history of the world, and you look at people who've really killed people or, or, or regimes that have really been totalitarian and genocidal, and you'll find some of them are atheistic, but some of them are religious. See, religious and irreligious people do not, have, neither of them have cornered the market on evil. And Jesus says, until you realize that qualitatively your heart is really no different than anybody else out there at all, you cannot be my disciple. The first stage is you have to destroy your whole old idea of sin and realize, I am a sinner, I am evil. But here's what the second stage is, that when you receive God's mercy, that makes you evil and yet a beloved child. Look at how weird this is. He says, the Most High makes you sons even though you're ungrateful and you're evil. And you say, now, aren't you st stretching it? No. Because just six chapters later, here's what Jesus says in Luke 11. He's talking about prayer, but here's what he says. He says to his disciples, if you who are evil, <laughs> evil, he's calling his disciples evil. Casually, offhand, you know, you're evil, you know, we all know that. 
That's one of the first lessons I've taught you. He says, if you are who are evil give gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give to you if you ask? And there it is. In the same breath, in the same sentence, you are evil and yet you are his beloved child. And that's the key. Is there any other religion? Is there any other philosophy? Is there any other way of thinking that says you are evil and yet you are utterly loved, a beloved child of God? No. Every other, every co common sense says you're either evil or you're his beloved child. You cannot be both. But the Christian, Christianity, the gospel says you are both. And when that happens, that's the key to all of the stuff we've been talking about. See, Kathy likes to say, when she hears people say, you know, fundamentalists are intolerant. And she says it all depends on what your fundamental is. Because if your fundamental is, if you live a good life, you'll go to heaven, of course that'll make you intolerant. In fact, if your fundamental is be good and try your hardest and just be a loving person and be an open-minded person, you'll feel superior to the bigots. But if your fundamental is a man dying on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. They really don't get it. They really, if that's your fundamental, how can they make you intolerant? Jesus Christ saved you by reversing values. He put himself where you deserve to be so that we can sit at his table where we deserve, he deserves to be. And because he saved you through reversal of values, once that sinks in and you realize, as Luther said, you're simultaneously both just and sinful, when that sinks in, then it completely changes your attitude toward people of different races, of different classes. Very important thing to remember on Martin Luther King Day. But it also, also changes your understanding of how you treat people who don't agree with you. And Jesus says, I can turn you into this kind of community. I can. I will. Listen, friends, as we go to the Lord's table, what we're actually doing is reminding ourselves that we're one family. But some of you say, I, I, I know that I'm supposed to be part of a Christian community like this, but I have to admit to you, one of the reasons why I have trouble joining or coming into a church, really all that, is I've been burned in the past, and I, you, know, you know, you talk like Christians are all going to be like this and that, but they're not. They're all at different levels of maturity, and some people are really wonderful, and some are really stellar, and others are just like babies, you know, and, and they're, uh, and I, and the, you know, I've been hurt and I've been burnt. Be patient. Remember this, as one author put it recently, it's just wonderful the way he put it. He says, the reason there are so many exhortations in the New Testament for Christians to love other Christians is because the church is not made up of natural friends, it's made up of natural enemies. What binds us together is not what binds together any other Christ human community. Every other human community is bound together by common education, common race, common income levels, common politics, common nationality, common accents, common jobs, or things like that. But Christians come together not because they, are from, they form a natural collocation, but because they have all been saved by Jesus Christ and owe him a common allegiance. Therefore, here's what the church is, a band of natural enemies who love one another for Jesus' sake. So be patient. It'll take time. But your heart needs it, and Jesus has the power for it. Let us pray. Father, help us as we take your bread and your cup to remember that we have been made one body through the brokenness of Jesus' body. Make us that one community, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. For more of this series and other resources from Timothy Keller and Redeemer Presbyterian Church, please visit www.gospelinlife.com.